and I surrendered all. <laughs> Have you now? John seven twenty four. Judge not according to the appearance. Isn't it so true? Appearances are deceiving. These are the words of the Lord. Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. I've entitled this message, Judge Righteous Judgment. Every decision we make, every choice we make, every opinion we have, with that exception, involves some kind of judgment, doesn't it? Judge righteous judgment. Not judge self-righteous judgment, but judge righteous judgment. That's the key word. Judge righteous judgment. I want to do that. And I would like to bring a scriptural message upon this subject. I've heard this verse quoted to justify moral outrage against society, the sins of society in general, and the sins of individuals in particular. And let me remind you, this is not judge self-righteous judgment. This is judge righteous judgment. I want to bring a message consistent with what this book has to say with regard to this scripture, and I covet your prayer as I attempt to bring a message on this subject, judge righteous judgment. What would you say is the most well-known and most often quoted scripture in the Bible? Now, somebody may think John 3, 16, and as far as religious people goes, that probably is the most quoted. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have Everlasting life. I love that verse of scripture. But I feel quite certain that is not the most often quoted scripture in the Bible. Here's what it is. Judge not. Everybody knows that one. Judge not. Don't judge me for practicing some questionable or even sinful activity. Don't judge me. The Bible says... Judge not. Indeed it does. When the Lord says judge not, we should not judge in the way the Lord is condemning. Beholding the little piece of dust in our brother's eye and being completely unperceptive to the two before in our own. The Lord does condemn that, and well, it should be condemned. Would you turn with me for a moment to Matthew chapter 7, where that statement by the Lord is made? Verse 1. Judge not that you be not judged. 
For with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. Now, what the Lord is saying is, if you judge somebody, you're going to be judged harshly by that person. They're actually going to be looking for things. If you have a judgmental, critical attitude toward them, they're going to be looking for reasons to be critical toward you. And it's not going to be hard to find them. If I have a judgmental, critical attitude toward you, you're going to see every flaw I have. And it's not hard if that's what you're looking for. Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. And then the Lord says, Why beholdest thou the mote that's in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam, the two before, that's in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite. I love the way the Lord says this. He knows what a hypocrite is, doesn't he? Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. The very next thing he says involves a judgment. Give not that which is holy unto the dog. Neither cast ye your pearls before swine. Now, as soon as he says judge not, he tells us of a judgment we're to make. We are called upon to make righteous judgments. Again, the key word is righteous, not self righteous judgments. They're so offensive but righteous judgments. Turn to Proverbs 17. I'm going to ask you to turn to several scriptures because I want you to see these. So would you turn to Proverbs chapter 17? Verse 15. He that justifieth the wicked... And he that condemneth the just, even they both are abomination to the Lord. Now here's a judgment to justify the wicked. There's a judgment involved. And there's a judgment involved in condemning the just. That's a judgment. Now, if God justifies somebody and I condemn them, that's an abomination to the Lord. And if God condemns somebody and I justify them, that is abomination to the Lord. When Abraham says to the Lord, when the Lord said, I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And he said, well, what if there's 50 righteous people there? You won't destroy the righteous with the wicked. And if you go on reading in Genesis chapter 18, he takes it down to 40, then 30, then 20, then 10, if you can just find 10 there. But he makes this statement, shall not the judge of the earth do right? Now, here's a judgment you and I are called upon to make. Whatever he does is right. And he does not do it because it's right. It's right because he does it. We trust his character. Somebody says, what about the bad things that are taking place? Shall not the judge of the earth do right? Right, 
It's all right. We might not be able to see it, but our God brings good out of evil. Here's the judgment we are called upon to make with regard to everything that happens under the sun. Shall not the judge of the earth do right? Um, the most evil thing to ever take place was when they nailed Christ to a cross. What's the most glorious thing to ever take place? When God gave his son to be nailed to a cross. Now, don't be God's judge. Don't sit in judgment on God and say, how could he let that happen? Why does it? He's God. We trust his character. Now, let's examine this statement in John chapter 7 in its context. Turn back to John chapter 7. Verse 19. John chapter 7, verse 19. Did not Moses give you the law? And yet, none of you keepeth the law. Was that a righteous judgment? Absolutely. And he could say that with regard to you and I. Not one of us keeps the law. You and I have not kept one commandment one time. That's what God says. And if you think you have, you demonstrate a complete ignorance of God's holy law. Why go ye about to kill me? The people answered and said, Thou hast a devil. You're crazy. You're demon possessed. Who goes about to kill you? Were they giving a right judgment? No. What the Lord was talking about when he said, why are you go are you about to kill me, was uh, in John chapter 5, when he healed the man that had been in bed for 38 years, paralyzed, he healed him on the Sabbath day. You can't do that on the Sabbath day. You're not supposed to work on the Sabbath day. They had a complete misunderstanding of the Sabbath. They didn't have a clue. Jesus, verse 21, Jesus answered and said unto them, I've done one work and you all marvel, talking about the healing of that man on the Sabbath day. Moses therefore gave unto you circumcision, not because it's of Moses, but of the fathers, and you on the Sabbath day circumcise a man. Now, what that's a reference to is on the eighth day, after birth, you were to be circumcised. Exactly eight days. Sometimes that eighth day fell on the Sabbath day. And are you breaking the Sabbath when you circumcise somebody on the eighth day? No. No, not at all. If a man on the Sabbath day receives circumcision, that, then, that the law of Moses should not be broken, are you angry at me? Because I've made a man every whit whole on the Sabbath day. Now, according to their appearance, he broke the Sabbath. <sighs> judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Would you turn to 1 Samuel chapter 16? This is a very important principle in what we're talking about. This is when the Lord has told Samuel to go anoint king, the king of his providing, the man after his own heart. Verse 3, God says to Samuel, call Jesse to the sacrifice. And I will show thee what thou shalt do. And thou shalt anoint unto him, unto me, him whom I name unto thee. 
And Samuel did that which the Lord spake and came to Bethlehem. And the elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, Comest thou peaceably? And he said, Peaceably. I'm come to sacrifice unto the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and called them to the sacrifice. And it came to pass when they were come that he looked on Eliab. And he said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before me. He's big and tall and good looking and he has everything that you would think would be what is needed for the king. Surely this is the one. He was judging according to appearance, wasn't he? He was judging according to the appearance. Verse 7. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance, or on the height of his stature. That's what he was looking at. Don't look at that, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Man looks on the outward appearance. And you know that's going on right now, isn't it? Every one of us are trying to project some kind of appearance. It's appearance. It's appearance. When we read that God sees his people as holy and unblameable and unreprovable. Now that's a scripture. Everybody that Christ died for. Everybody that Christ died for without exception is called by Paul in Colossians chapter 1 verse 22 holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Now if I'm holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight, guess what? I'm holy. I'm unblameable. And I'm unreprovable because God sees things as they are. Me and you don't. He does. And this is what the work of Christ did in behalf of every believer. He made every believer holy, without blame, nothing to ball me out for. I'm perfect in Christ Jesus, in God's sight. When we read in Romans chapter 3, verse 19, now we know that whatsoever things the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law that no that we should every mouth should be stopped in all the world staying guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. I want us to think a little bit about his sight. He sees things as they are. We never see things as they are. That's one of the reasons we can't make an accurate judgment. We don't see things as they are. We don't know the facts. We are unable to make a proper judgment about anything. But oh, his sight. So what about judge not? That you be not judged. How many times has this been thrown in your face when you hear something that's contrary to the gospel, contrary to the attributes of God, Contrary to what God's word says. And somebody says if you make some objection. Judge not. Judge not. You ought not judge people's religion. You ought not judge people's beliefs. Don't be a judge. Judge not. The Bible says judge not. That's the same principle as your child acting in a defiant disobedience unto you. And when, you, when you're getting ready to punch him. They say don't judge me. <laughs> don't judge me. You're going to find out that that is uh, not accurate. Um, you shall be judged <laughs> in that sense. So what is the Lord saying uh, when he says, judge not that you be not judged? Does that mean we're not supposed to judge what we hear? Of course not. Try the spirits, whether they be of God. You better make a judgment with regarding everything you hear, whether it's what God's word actually 
teach us. Does that mean we do not have an opinion regarding right and wrong? Of course it doesn't mean that. But here's what the Lord means when he says judge not. I don't feel myself qualified to be anybody's judge. You don't feel qualified to be somebody's judge because you believe yourself to be so sinful that you being critical and judgmental of anybody is an act of extreme hypocrisy. That's what that's talking about. Let me make good on that in the scripture. Turn to Romans chapter 2. Let's begin in chapter 1, verse 29. Paul is describing the sins of the Gentiles. And he says, being filled. Plumful. Plumful. There's nothing else there. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Are these folks wicked? Are these folks evil? Is there any question about the utter wickedness of who Paul just describes? Now look what he says next in chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, thou art inexcusable, O man. Me and you. That is a general term with regard to every single individual alive therefore thou art inexcusable O man whosoever thou art that judgest for wherein thou judgest another you condemn yourself for you the judge do the same things everything mentioned in that horrible list of sin you too and for me or you To sit in judgment in a critical, haughty, self-righteous manner over anybody with regard to any sin they might commit. It's an act of hypocrisy because God's word says, I do the same thing. Somebody says, I don't do that. Yeah, you do. You do. No, I don't. God says you do. Am I going to believe God or you? I believe God. God says this with regard to everybody in this room and everybody outside of this room. Thou art inexcusable, O man. That covers every individual. James chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. He that speaks evil of his brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not... Uh, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. There's one lawgiver who's able to save and destroy, but you, and this is what James is saying, the double, but you, who are you to judge another? You have no moral authority. I hope every one of us sees that about ourselves. Judge not, that you be not judged. I love what Paul said in Romans chapter 14, verse 4. Who are you to judge another man's servant? You you don't answer to me. 
I don't answer to you. Who are you to judge somebody else's servant? I'm the Lord's servant. You don't have any business judging me. You're the Lord's servant. I don't have any business judging you. I love it there in John chapter, uh, if you've gone on reading in, in John chapter 21, the Lord uh, said uh, uh, to Peter, he said, you're, when, you're, when you're old, they're going to drag you off and carry you into a place where you would in this city uh, with regard to what death you'll glorify God. He told Peter he's going to be crucified upside down. And that death was going to glorify God. You know, that, that, how glorious that is that when he calls something like that something that glorify God. How glorious. And you know what Peter said? Peter never could keep his mouth shut. He said, what about John? <laughs> None of your business. What's that to you? Follow thou me. In verse 10 of Romans chapter 14, he says, Why dost thou judge thy brother, or set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, you know what he's saying? He's not saying, you better watch out, because you're going to stand before judgment. He's going to stand before judgment. We're, uh, he's saying, well, all, every brother will stand, accepted, justified, cleared of all guilt before the judgment seat of Christ. What are you doing judging him when God has justified him? And he also said in Romans chapter 14, verse 13, let us not judge one another anymore. Would to God that that would be me and you. Let us not judge one another anymore. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 31, here's a good judgment. Talking about judging righteous judgment. Here's righteous judgment. If we judge ourselves, we would not be condemned. Now there is righteous judgment. Judge yourself. Take sides with God against yourself. That's righteous judgment. Judge yourself. And we're promised in the scriptures by Paul, if we judge ourselves, we wouldn't be condemned. You see, if you judge yourself guilty as charged, you've got nowhere else to look but Christ. You can't, you can't trust anything about you. It's all sin. The only place you have to look is Christ. That's a good place to be, isn't it? I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. If we judge ourselves, that's righteous judgment. Condemn yourself. Put the rope around your neck, guilty as charged, before God. And I'm not talking about trying to uh, show men how sorry you are and how more. Uh, don't do, this is before God. Right now, judge yourself, guilty as charged. You know what? You won't be condemned. You will look to Christ as your righteousness before God. Everybody that judges themselves, that's what happens. They look to Christ and they are not condemned. Acts chapter 4, verse 19. I love what Peter said to the rulers of the Jews after they commanded them not to preach in the name of Christ. He said, whether it be right... In the sight of God to hearken unto you rather than God judge ye. For we cannot but speak the things which we've seen and heard. What's your judgment? Should I obey you or God? That's a righteous judgment, isn't it? Should I obey you or God? You be the judge. Our rule of faith and conduct is what he said. Every word in the Bible is to be believed and loved. This is God's word. Somebody says, I don't know if I believe it. Well, if God says it, I believe it. I love what Donnie Bell said. 
If the Bible said that Jonah swallowed the whale, I'd believe it. Me too. Well, how could that be? I don't know. But I believe what God says. This is the inspired word of God that we bow to and that we believe. Now, let me quote this scripture to you that uh, I, I quote a lot. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Paul said, And I, brethren, when I came to you, I came not with excellency of speech or of knowledge, declaring unto you the testimony of God. I didn't try to wow you with my oratorical ability or my... Uh, no. I determined. Now that word determined is I judged. The word we're looking at. I made this my judgment to know nothing among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Now have you and I ever made that judgment where we judge that the only thing to preach, the only thing to hear, the only message there is, is Jesus Christ and him crucified. This is the meaning of every scripture. This, this, is, this is everything in my salvation. Jesus Christ and him crucified when he said it is finished. What was finished? My salvation. My salvation. It is finished. That's Jesus Christ and him crucified. You know, that's, that's all I need for comfort. That's all I need for motivation. I don't need, you can whip me with the law and all it's going to do is make me resent. But oh, if I see Christ and him crucified, that motivates me to want to be only his in every respect. Here's my judgment. Not to preach, not to listen to anything else. Jesus Christ and him crucified. Would you turn with me for a moment to 2 Corinthians chapter 5? Verse 13. For whether we be beside ourselves, it's to God, or whether we be sober, it's for your cause. For the love of of Christ constraineth us because we thus judge. Now there's that word judge. Here's righteous judgment. You want to know what righteous judgment is? Here it is. We thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. Who is the all? Is he talking about all men without exception? No. He said, I laid down my life for the sheep. He died for all of the elect. Somebody says, well, that means everybody without exception. No, it doesn't. <laughs> no, it does not. It doesn't even imply that. But here is the Necessary truth that comes from this. For the love of Christ constrains us because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves. You know what it's called? Self denial. Self denial. Denial. Deny righteous self. Deny self-indulgent, self-seeking, self-promotion, self-whatever self it is. 
in light of the gospel of Jesus Christ and his love for me and me being dead in him and raised together in him, I'm not to live to myself. I want to live to him who died for me and rose again for me. Now that's righteous judgment. If he died for me, then I want to live to him. I want to deny myself, take up my cross, the confession of what he accomplished on Calvary's tree, and follow him. Now that's righteous judgment. You look at what Jesus Christ has done for you. That makes you want to give yourself completely to him. And I'm not saying I surrender all. I'm saying he surrendered all. And that's what makes me want to give myself to him. He surrendered all. Turn with me to Luke chapter 10. This is our closing scripture. Judging righteous judgment. Verse 38. Now it came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. You ladies, how uh, would you want to make everything perfect if the Lord was going to come to your house today in the flesh? Would you fix the best meal you've ever fixed? And would you have the straightest, cleanest house you've ever had before? I dare say you would. Maybe some of you would, I don't know. <laughs> but for the most part, I'd say we want the best. And you can see Martha at this time. I want everything perfect. And she had a sister called Mary which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. The word of Christ. One chose to make everything perfect. The other chose to sit at his feet and hear his word. I wish I could express his word. He is the word of God. Every word that came out of his mouth was words of spirit and words of life. The word of the Lord Jesus Christ. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. There Martha is scurrying around and there Mary is, contemplating her navel, I guess is what Martha thought. I'm doing everything. All she's doing is sitting there listening. Verse 40, but Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her, therefore, that she help me. Now, one thing to never do is tell the Lord what to do. You don't do that. But she kept looking at her sister Mary, and I'm sure her resentment just kept boiling over and over. Look at her. Look at me doing everything, and she's doing nothing. And she cries out to the Lord, Bid her that she help me. Verse 41, and Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. 
Could that not be said of us? Thou art careful, anxious, stressed out, troubled about many things. But one thing is needful. One thing. And Mary hath chosen that good part. Sitting at his feet. What a good place to be, isn't it? At the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. Sitting at his feet. Hearing his word. Now that's making a righteous judgment, isn't it? To sit at his feet and hear his word, the word of the gospel. That's the one thing that's needful. Now, do you and I believe that? That's the one thing that's needful and necessary. Judge not according to the appearance. The Lord says, everything you see, you don't get it. Neither do I. And with regard to what somebody else is going through and the judgment we make, we don't get it. And we don't have the proper information to even make a correct judgment with regard to anything anybody's going through. Don't, don't judge. Don't judge. Don't judge according to the appearance. But judge righteous judgment not self-righteous judgment righteous judgment may the lord enable all of us to do just that and let me tell you what the most righteous judgment you can do is to trust christ alone now that is righteous judgment let's pray Lord, we ask in the high and holy name of thy Son that we would be enabled to judge righteous judgment, to look to the righteousness and merits of your Son. We ask that you would give us the grace, like Paul said, to thus judge, that if Christ died for all, then we're all dead dead to the thoughts and cares of this world and the maxims of this world and that we should live unto him who died for us and rose again. Lord, bless your word for your glory and for our good. In Christ's name we pray.